सिद्धार्थ चैटर्जी एलियस सिड इज द यूनाइटेड नेशंस रेसिडेंट कोऑर्डिनेटर फॉर केनिया सिंस 26 अगस्त 2016 ही लीड्स द यूएन कंट्री टीम टू डिलीवर ऑन द यूएन डेवलपमेंट असिस्टेंस फ्रेमवर्क इन केनिया अंटिल हिज न्यू अपॉइंटमेंट सिड हैज बीन सर्विंग एज द यूएनएफपीए रिप्रेजेंटेटिव फॉर केनिया His early career was in his special forces unit of the Indian Army where he was decorated in 1995 for bravery by the president of India. He was profiled by Forbes magazine in an article titled Passionate Leader of UNFPA Kenya Battles Violence Against Women FGM and Child Marriage. He holds a master's degree in public policy from the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs. at princeton university usa and a bachelor of sciences from the national defense academy in india namaskar darshko main hu ashish aur aap aaj dekh rahe hain nagrik news par jo hamare sath ek shakhsiyat baithe hue hain aapka naam siddharth chatterjee hai aur aap jo hain united nation ke kenya mein coordinator hain रेसिडेंट कोऑर्डिनेटर हैं सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट गोल जो यूनाइटेड नेशन का जो एक सतत विकास लक्ष्य प्रोग्राम चल रहा है उसके ऊपर और नागरिक न्यूज़ शुरू से ही इस मामले में अपनी एक कवरेज लगातार इस क्षेत्र में कर रहा है तो हमारी बड़ी खुशकिस्मती है कि आज सिद्धार्थ जी हमारे साथ मिले हैं और आज हम सर के साथ बात करेंगे उन विषयों को जानेंगे सर आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है थैंक यू बहुत शुक्रिया सर जो आपका जो सफ़र है चूँकि आप इंडियन हैं और अब भारतीय होते हुए जैसे आपने यहाँ पर काम किया अपनी जर्नी के बारे में बताएं कि यूएन आप कैसे गए यूएन से फिर आप किनिया कैसे गए इसके विषय में जरा हमारे दर्शकों को आप बताएं सो आई स्टार्टेड माय करियर इन द इंडियन आर्मी एंड आई जॉइंट द नेशनल डिफेंस एकेडमी इन खड़कवासला एंड फ्रॉम खड़कवासला आई वेंट टू द इंडियन मिलिट्री एकेडमी एंड आई जॉइंट द टेंथ पैरा कमांडो स्पेशल फोर्सेस यूनिट सो आई सर्व देयर फॉर 10 इयर्स एंड ड्यूरिंग दोस 10 इयर्स इट वाज क्वाइट अ वॉयज ऑफ डिस्कवरी अ वॉयज ऑफ डिस्कवरी ऑफ the nature of instability the nature of insurgencies the nature of human development the nature of development of environments and what happens when nation states have to deal with issues of uh, people that have risen up and to understand that much more carefully so those were questions that came up in my mind so when i fought in, as a soldier in the northeast of india or i went to sri lanka you know everything has a purpose there is no reason that people will just get up and start to fight each other it's not just you know people overtaken by madness so those were questions that i started dealing with as a as a young officer in the army and that's when i realized that probably my time had come i was decorated for gallantry by the president of india in 1995 but then there's this word called a subconscious disquiet and the subconscious disquiet overwhelm me and that's when i decided to make a move out and i started my first job in the un mission in sarajevo in bosnia herzegovina where i started as a security officer and from there my journey started in 1997 and today it's 22 years and i've served in bosnia in iraq in south sudan in uh, somalia in indonesia in darfur uh, back again in iraq so it's been a it's been quite a quite a journey in different parts of very fragile complex conflict driven environments but it has also been a journey of great learning you know understanding the frailties of humanity and also what the accomplishments of humanity are so i've seen both sides of humanity one is an ugly side and yet one is a side which is of great giving of of a humanitarian purpose of a humanitarian principle and uh, you know when the un secretary general mr antonio guterres says that the world is in pieces and we need world peace he's so right you know and today much more than ever the importance of multilateralism is crucial and that's why that is where my journey started and today i'm i have the honor of serving in the united nations as the resident coordinator in kenya and i'm actually seeing real transformation happening in a country which has come from a long period of colonization became independent in 1963 and how it took responsibility for itself and the advancements it is making and that is the environment i'm serving in so uh, i'm seeing that as a country kenya is a beacon of hope in africa and what it is doing is the rapid transformation of embracing human development of embracing humanity of advancing a lot of people that have got left behind in the development curve 
and bringing them forward. It's a similar story with India, you know, very, very many similarities, both where former colonies, both have come out from the ashes of tragedy, both have now become beacons of hope in their respective environments. So as an Indian ex-military officer, it truly is an honor to be serving in Kenya. And above all, having a Secretary General who has a vision for a very transformed, effective, delivering as one, fit for purpose United Nations system. So sir, as you have mentioned that महासचिव जो हैं यूएन के उन्होंने कहा कि पूरा विश्व टुकड़ों में बटा है और उसको शांति की जरूरत है उसके लिए शांति के लिए कार्य किया जाए तो जो एसडीजी में जो हमारे सत्रह गोल हैं जो सेवेंटीन गोल जो यूएन की तरफ से चल रहे हैं वो कीनिया में आप उसके परिदृश्य में क्या देखते हैं कीनिया में हालात कैसे हैं और एस हमारा वहाँ पर कैसा काम कर रहा है Kenya is demonstrating rapid progress on the sustainable development goals. In fact, it has a president who's had a vision of what the country needs. So instead of going for all the 17 goals, he's focused on four very important goals. One is universal health coverage, which is SDG goal uh, number three. The second goal he's focused on is food security and agriculture, which is SDG goal number two. The third goal he is chosen is affordable housing. That means Kenya today has a shortfall of about 2 million houses for the, for the low income groups. He's focusing on that. And the fourth goal he's, choosing, uh, he's chosen is manufacturing. Now, if you look at these four goals, our economists actually sat down and looked at these four goals that he's focused on. It actually affects all the 17 goals. It has a multiplier effect across all the 17 goals. But the goal number 17 is the most important here. It's about the kind of partnerships we forge. It's not just about the traditional type of partnerships, about a few UN agencies coming together with some NGOs and the government. Now it is looking at large-scale public-private partnerships. It is looking at partnerships of South-South cooperation. A, a discussion has already started between Kenya and India as to how to promote South-South cooperation and how two countries can learn from each other, their experiences, their 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 accomplishments as well as their failures and how they can move together this is going to be the new norm of advancement as a and as a multilateral institution the united nations can become an effective broker in helping to weave this public private partnership so when i look at these four goals that president kenyatta has chosen for example universal health coverage why is it so important in kenya every year one million kenyans get trapped into poverty because of an out-of-pocket health shock it's the same story in India. Yeah. Because of an out-of-pocket health shock, they get trapped into poverty. There are two things in common. There's one thing in common. Both countries had not invested earlier on in the preventative side of healthcare, the primary healthcare system, which needs to be robust. If you look at the Asian Tigers or you look at Western Europe, they invested in preventative health. So less and less people fell sick and fell into the curative side, if you see what I mean. So here, they've taken on and that is why if you see a big push by Prime Minister Modi, a huge push by President Kenyatta on the whole aspect of universal health coverage and where it will start is when you make sure that every child, every woman is properly immunized, there is proper nutrition, there is prevention of waterborne and vector-borne diseases, there is prevention of diseases like lifestyle diseases like diabetes and hypertension and there is improvement of maternal and child health which are fundamental to preventative health care. So, if I look at similarities between the two countries, the two countries are doing quite an incredible job because what they are doing is they are trying to change the paradigm. We don't have to follow the path that probably a Singapore or a UK took in terms of universal health coverage. Today there's big data, there's technology and innovation that can allow us to leapfrog in that dimension. Take agribusiness. Now, India had a green revolution in the late 60s. Lyndon Johnson felt, the American president then felt that it was important that India should not succumb to the scourge of a famine given such a large democracy. And India is to lose a large amount of people because of famines. Now what happened was that they sent in a, a mathematician by the name of Lester Brown who actually analyzed what the needs were and based on that came together the need of 600 ships worth of, of, of wheat that was needed to offset the, the, the nature of that famine. But they also saw that why should the country be dependent on aid? Why can't we look at the pattern of a green revolution? And that's what changed India. That's what transformed India. And today with 1.35 billion people, we don't have people going hungry because of famine. So it's an interesting 
correlation that I can see happening in Kenya too. Kenya can become the breadbasket of Africa, and we need a green revolution there. Can Kenya learn something from India? Absolutely, yes. Can India learn something from what Kenya is doing? Absolutely, yes. So there is, a, there is an opportunity for cross-pollination there. The third is affordable housing. You know, housing is about basic dignity. It's the izzat. You know, when you don't have a home, you are vulnerable to an environment, to circumstances, to the elements of weather. A woman cannot feel protected that her own child is safe because she can't lock a door. So I commend President Kenyatta to have seen that affordable housing is going to be a key requirement. There's a two million shortfall in affordable housing. Do we have to build a house from bricks and mortars in the traditional way? Perhaps not. Technology has allowed us to even go for 3D printed houses. So you're revolutionizing, you're industrializing. It's like the manufacturing of a car. Uh, in Maruti, when they produce a Maruti 800, it's, and it's an assembly line. Can't we do the same for houses? That's what has started to happen. That's the technology which has started to come into place. So the potential opportunities that the, the big four and the manufacturing sector, and the manufacturing sector includes what is called the blue economy, what is offshore and onshore. It includes the green economy. There are plenty of opportunities for these two countries to learn from each other. In fact, from Africa to learn from India, India to learn from Africa. But most importantly, both countries have a median age of 18. The average age of an Indian and the average age of a Kenyan and the average age of an uh, African is 18 years old. It is the youngest population we will ever have. In the next 30, 40 years, this population will change. Every year, every month, one million Indians join the workforce. Every year, one million Kenyans join the workforce. The age profile is 15 to 26. Now, if we want to reap what is called a demographic dividend, or to take advantage of this youthful population, they have to be employed. Now, in order to be employed, they have to be educated and properly skilled. Now, if they are to be properly educated and skilled, they have to be fully empowered with knowledge. They have to be better nourished. They must have access to good health. They must have access to good health outcomes. Women must be able to join the workforce. Today, India, only 23% of our women in the workforce. So when you look at a household, and a woman is not part of the workforce, she becomes a dependent. As a result, there is only one single income. Now, when that husband falls sick, or God, for, God forbid he dies, the woman is left absolutely helpless and fragile. So as a result, you're creating a woman and a group of children who are falling into the poverty trap. Whereas imagine if they were both working, there is more disposable income. And that is what changed, let's say, the story of South Korea, or the Asian tigers. They made sure that the man and women in the workforce the woman was able to plan her family and therefore the importance of sexual reproductive health and rights so crucial that a woman should be able to plan her family and based on that they are able to give better education, better nutrition, better you know, health outcomes for their children. So very fundamental issues but if we want the SDGs to succeed the first five goals are very important. Goal number one is about zero poverty. Goal number two, zero hunger. Goal number three, universal health coverage. Goal number four, proper education and universal education, access to education. And goal number five is gender equality. Why have we put these as the first five goals? Because that's the unfinished business from the Millennium Development Goals. And if you see, we have a Secretary General in the UN, Mr. Antonio Guterres. Perhaps the first Secretary General, who's also a feminist, he really believes in the equality of gender, in the parity of gender, in advancing the UN mandate. Because if we don't have a gender lens, we will have unequal societies. And when societies are unequal, they remain impoverished. So if you look at the pattern of growth of South Korea, China, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, you know, Japan, all of them, if you see, their women were very much part of the workforce. You look at Western Europe. And yet there are countries in Asia which are not called tigers. Have you ever given that a thought? I'm sure your audience would want to think about something like this. Timing-wise, it's perfect. I believe that India and Kenya are showing what I would term as three Ps. First is political will, very strong political will by both the leaders. Second is the right public policies have been instituted. Great opportunity of the kind of social transformation that we need. But the third is partnerships, where you have to look at a whole new ecosystem of partnerships. The might of the private sector of India, of Kenya, of Africa, coming together, looking at opportunities, 
working with the United States of America, working with China, working with Russia, looking at economic growth, where everybody benefits. Because when you have economic growth, you'll have a larger middle class. When you have a larger middle class, they can buy a Rolex from Switzerland, or they can buy you know, uh, tea from Kenya, or they can buy good flowers from Netherlands. It's only when you have disposable income. But if you have inequality within society, but within countries too, where are the markets? So the future markets, if the West, in the United States, if the Asian tigers are smart, they will know that their future market is going to be in India and, and in Africa. Because Africa's population will be 2.3 billion by 2050. 2050, of which 830 million will be young people. Imagine the market potential of these two, of these two parts. Look at the neighborhood of India. If you just put Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, you know, Burma, uh, Sri Lanka, put it all together, I see the SARC as, as, as another you know, cauldron of opportunity. You know? But it has to have connectivity. You can't evolve on your own. Markets are interdependent. Economics is interdependent. So therefore, economics should drive harmony rather than become a divider and, and seen as a competition. Sir, these five SDGs that are in the SDGs, these five SDGs that are in the SDGs, प्राथमिक लक्ष्यों की ओर आपने जो इशारा किया भारत में भी कुछ कुछ वैसी स्थितियां चल रही हैं जैसे स्किल डेवलपमेंट हमारे यहाँ चल रहा है जब से प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी की सरकार आई है उसके बाद आवास योजना चल रही है यहाँ पे सस्ते अफोर्डेबल आवास किस तरीके से लोगों को मुहैया किए जाए स्वास्थ्य सुविधाएँ यूनिवर्सिटीज़ इसके ऊपर इस सरकार का काफ़ी फोकस है जैसा कि कीनिया में है तो ये जो ये जो कीनिया और इंडिया का जो आपने एक विस्तार हमारे दर्शकों को बताया कि सिमिलैरिटी है और बहुत सारी चीज़ें हैं दोनों में पॉलिटिकल भी एक जैसा है तो सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट गोल इसको लागू करने का ग्राउंड लेवल पे ग्रामीण क्षेत्रों में जो भारत में और कीनिया में जो प्रयास हो रहे हैं क्या उस, उसके बारे में आप जरा हमारे दर्शकों को बताएं तो इधर द मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट थिंग इज लीडरशिप बोथ एट द हाइस्ट लेवल ऑफ विच बोथ the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, are doing, and as the President of Kenya, President Kenyatta is doing. Now that leadership has to translate all the way to the ground level. So Kenya has a huge program of devolution which started in 2012, 2013. And I must commend Kenya because with the speed with which that devolution has happened, if I were to compare that to India, when India started to devolve around independence time, Kenya, I would say, is somewhere close to the mid-90s of where India was. So they've actually moved quite fast. But then they had the advantage of, of innovation, of information, of technology that helped make things happen. One thing I want to say is that the first time of India was very good. After the globalization, the globalization of India started, it was very important. At that time, Kenya was also on that time. Correct. 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 So it is, you know, globalization is a key opportunity for that interface. You know, the more... I mean, if you look at, that's exactly right. If you look at pre-1990s India, India was locked into its own environment. And therefore, you did not see the kind of growth that the country needed. The moment Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, if I remember correctly, you know, kind of opened that door, it opened up opportunities of transformational change. And you see, fundamentally, if I look at Kenya and India, it has very strong human capital, highly educated <laughs> people. You know, they reach top positions. In, 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 in government, in, in private sector, in the tech sector. They really are advancing well. What is important now is how do we catalyze this human potential into what I would call as a range of partnerships, which covers, for example, the Big Four agenda that President Kenyatta has identified and the Make in India model that Prime Minister Modi has, uh, has identified. I don't see a dichotomy there. I actually see opportunities of convergence because ultimately, for even for, let's say, the Indian private sector, the markets have to go beyond India if they want to look at a longer-term growth pattern. Take the example of a company like Unilever. Everybody knows Unilever because it's called Hindustan Lever in India. Do you know that Unilever established its first factory in India, a Dutch, Anglo-Dutch company, a British-Dutch company, in 1908, when we were a poor country, we were a colony. They established their first factory then. Our population was between 150 to 200 million then. In 2018, with a population of 1.3 billion, two out of three Indians uses a Unilever product of some sort. You go to your house, you'll find something which is Unilever related. Definitely. This is why I'm saying, now what took Unilever 100 years has now shrunk 
to four, five years. Because today, you want to put a product on Facebook or on Twitter or on the internet, within seconds, there are hundreds of thousands of people seeing that. So you've cut down the whole perspective of time and space has shrunk. Which means that we don't need to go through a process. We can actually jump many of those processes in order to advance it. The most important thing, my friend, is when I talked about education and skills, I talked about empowerment and bringing women into the workforce. I talked about employment. There is one another very important E there, and that's equity. Now, when you have unequal, when there is inequity, that's when you start to have instability. So you will start to see pockets of instability in different parts of the world. And a lot of it is related to inequity. And that inequity then takes on aspects of radicalization, and it takes on violence, and it becomes violent extremism, and then it becomes you know, terror. So there are certain drivers we must be mindful of, and they are very much development related. So I'll go back to what the UN Secretary General often says. He talks about what is called the triple nexus. The triple nexus of peace, security, and development. You can't just go with the sledgehammer of violence trying to sort out things. Otherwise, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, uh, you know, so many countries which have seen grave violence would have been sorted out like that. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen that way any longer. And today, the armed might, might is no longer a right. That has changed with technology. Yeah, Somalia can also see it. Exactly. Take Somalia. Take South Sudan. You know, there is no might which has worked there. It's remain, retained a status quo. So which means we need to look at a whole new paradigm. The old paradigm of going in with military forces and trying to quell it has not worked for any country, however mighty, however powerful, however big their army is. When the Secretary General says, talks about peace, security, and development, we are not saying that you have to rule out the security component. The security component is important, but the development component is crucial. The peace component is crucial. Nobody should be out of bounds when it comes to having a dialogue. The importance of mediation, the importance of dialogue, the importance of diplomacy. So as a former soldier, I'm saying our diplomats, our civil service, which we should be far more equipped to take affirmative steps, whether it's through first, second, or third tracks of diplomacy, both within the country and outside. But peace should be the first motive, because the alternative is unviable and we've seen that and today there are over 67 million people displaced globally the highest displacement since the second world war it is related to climate climatic degradation it is related to environmental reason it's related to conflict it's related to instability it's related to lack of governance now when you have instability of this sort people will leave their places and go they will come through the northeastern boundaries don't you know you can't put a wall and an army man everywhere, they will still come because they, will, they want to flee difficult circumstances. So when you talk about the Rohingya refugees, they are human beings, number one. They are not, you know, they are not from, uh, from Mars. And why are they leaving? Who wants to leave? My father was a refugee from Bangladesh. Yeah. Why did he leave? Because of the partition of India. When the partition of India happened, people got divided as per their race, their caste, their religion. And what did it do? It created long-term instability in our continent. And that instability is something which we still confront. So the primacy of politics, and this is why the Secretary General has emphasized this, the primacy of politics, the primacy of making peace, the primacy of, of security, and the primacy of development. Look at this comprehensively. Once we start do, doing that, a wealthy world, a healthy world, a happy world, is where we all want our children to grow. We don't want to be suspicious that our child goes to school and someone will come and shoot them. We don't want to be worried about the fact that our child is in a school bus and the school bus gets bombed. Those are the everyday realities parents, not just in India, but anywhere in the world today are confronted with. So therefore, that the, the call of when the Secretary General says that the world is in pieces is so accurate. We, I believe, as a nation state in India, have the leadership, have the political vision, have the will to have that transformative effect. This is precisely what we are seeing in Kenya. So I can see that in, if you look at the Horn of Africa, if you just look at five countries, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Ethiopia, these five countries may have a double-digit economic growth in the next five to 10 years. It would be very smart, not just for India, but for China, and for Russia, and for Japan, and for West to start looking 
at the Horn of Africa because these are five countries that can also guarantee stability in their fragile backyards. Sir, as you have mentioned in the SDG, in India, the government is doing a good job. The Prime Minister Narendra Modi is a good job. His actions are very good. The Prime Minister of India is a good job. The Prime Minister of India is a good job. The Prime Minister of India is a good job. प्रयास कर रहा है इसके अलावा जब हम देखते हैं तो गैर सरकारी संगठनों में जैसे नागरिक फाउंडेशन हो गया एक्शन एड हो गया या नागरिक डायलॉग ये जो कुछ संस्थाएं हैं जो एसडीजी को लेके बहुत ही सशक्त तरीके से अपने कदम उठा रही हैं बहुत गंभीरता से भारत में काम कर रही हैं क्या इस तरीके की गैर सरकारी संगठन कीनिया में भी हैं और वो काम कर रहे हैं एब्सोल्युटली सो सिविल सोसाइटी इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट and government must embrace civil society because those are the boots on the ground. They get to the most remote villages. You know, India defeated polio in 2011-2012. First time ever. I'm saying this because I'm a polio survivor. It had never defeated polio. It was only able to defeat polio because of, first of all, international global will and a political push like the Gates Foundation, like WHO, like UNICEF, the UN, the private sector, international organizations coming together. But because there was strong political will at the country level, but that political will got translated into different segments of civil society that went into the remotest parts of India to make sure every child was immunized. And that's how we defeated it. Given the the challenges that we have in our country, the logistics, the infrastructure, the instability in certain pockets of India, it's a miracle. It is a miracle that India could do that. Now, if India can do that, my friend, India can do many other things. It can actually lift every Indian out of poverty and be a role model for many other parts of the world. That is why the SDGs are crucial. That is why the Sustainable Development Goals are crucial. And that is why you need partners such as the Nagrik Foundation, such as other NGOs to come and board and be seen as equal partners on the table because ultimately they can transform policy into action. Because, you know, I've been in government so I can tell you this, that, you know, we can have the greatest policies but to translate those policies into something real has always been a challenge. So you need a wide range of partners, including the private sector, to translate those policies. And, and you know, the, I, I mean, CSR, corporate social responsibility, is important. But if you want something to be sustainable, I'm telling you of the of the model of of uh, Unilever, which is Hindustan Lever. They didn't start off as a as a social charitable network. They started for started off from a pro profit motive, and today it employs huge numbers of Indians and has is has a huge market potential. This is how we need to look at it, because frankly, without ensuring that we have the right public policy space without the right political will and without the right partnerships, we will not be able to achieve these goals because 11 years is just around the corner. 11 years will just go by very quickly. So I think it will be very, very important that we have the civil society space and ensure that we are able to leapfrog and not go through a, a graduated approach, which means that you need to start revamping human capital too. You know, it is very important to learn about what happened in the Chandragupta Maurya dynasty and all that, but does that make me really useful when I have to go fix a computer? So that history part is important, but by the time a child comes into grade five or six, they should be fully fluent in multifaceted skill sets. So by the time they finish school, they should know whether they want to go to university or they want to become a farmer or a plumber or a mason or a carpenter, perhaps. A mason or a carpenter has a better employability chance than a child who's graduated and got a master's degree in history. Definitely. So we have to start looking at what is called the dignity in labor. So if you remember, in the 60s, India made a clarion call. It was called Jai Jawan Jai Kisan. Why was that call made? It was because we were going through repeated famines. We, the, the leadership then realized that, look, let's equate the farmer to that of a soldier. And suddenly the status of the farmer went up with that call of Jai Jawan Jai Kisan. So if you look at the late 60s and the way India's Green Revolution started, it's because the farmer felt a deep sense of pride in what he or she was doing in supporting their, their country and making India food secure. This is precisely what we need across the board. Now you go to Western Europe, go to Denmark, probably a plumber or a mason may make more, num more money than a doctor. So I just think 
the time has now come for these two parts of the world, of India and its neighborhood, of all of Africa, to really look at a new way of doing business. And that is not just reliant on handouts or aid, but to really look at aid and trade models that start to actually make sure that growth happens. And growth happens when you have good human capital, which is educated, which is skilled, and which is healthy, which falls at the fundamental part of it. Sir, the last question is, और प्रश्न ये है कि जो साउथ साउथ को ऑपरेशन है जिसके बारे में आपने बताया मैं चाहूँगा कि हमारे दर्शकों को थोड़ा और आप उसको डिटेल में बताएं इसके अलावा आप चूँकि बहुत नज़दीक से एसडीजी को देख रहे हैं या कहें कि उसको आप जी रहे हैं उसी ज़िंदगी को आप आप लागू करा रहे हैं उसको वहाँ पर कीनिया में तो आप हमारे जितने देखने वाले दर्शक हैं उनको आप एस के बारे में क्या कहना चाहते हैं सो दस डी इज प्रमेरली an agreement of the whole international community coming together to say yes there is certain unpart of unfinished business which is the first five goals and there are certain key ingredients that we need in order to make sure that we are a healthy advanced economically viable society if you look at sdg goal number 16 it is about peace it is about building institutions which ensure the process of but if you look across the SDG goals, it will not happen unless it's everybody coming together to deliver as one. And now today, to do the to fulfill the requirements of the SDG, there's a funding gap of between 2.5 to 5 trillion dollars to achieve that. Now that funding it cannot come from governments, and nor do that money grow on trees. How do you make the SDGs? Uh, investor-friendly approach, which is what we are doing in Kenya with the government of Kenya, we've, uh, the United Nations have come together and formed an SDG public-private partnership platform. And this has already started to reap quite a lot of results. I believe that the whole ecosystem of South-South cooperation offers a great opportunity because there's so much of cross-learning that can happen. There is so much of goods and services that are already produced which could be obtained at much cheaper prices. But it, it also allows for a larger connectivity with the technology that the West and the United States and the Canada can and provide just as South Korea, Japan and Singapore can provide. So you'll have to embrace all of it. And this is when it will start to happen. So for example, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, uh, Amina Mohammed, who is a Nigerian, and just so you know, that when you invest in human capital, how it transforms, she is the daughter of a herder. Her father was a shepherd. And look at where she's reached. It is just because she was given an opportunity and she was not discriminated by a, for her gender and she was given all the tools to advance. And look where she could get to. There are countless Indian women who've, who've not been given that opportunity and therefore have got left behind in the development curve. I think there is so much we could learn from within each other of how societies have evolved. But fundamentally, my friend, and I'm saying this to every Indian that is watching this show. Sustainable development goal number five is crucial. In fact, it is the anchor on gender equality on which societies will progress. Till such time, we, start, we have issues of patriarchy and misogyny and inequality of genders, societies will not progress, which is exactly what we've seen with, with, uh, with the Asian tigers as they progress, which is exactly what we've seen in Western Europe. And frankly, I can see Kenya and India being a model of advancing the SDG 5 agenda. We get that right. Trust me, not only will we achieve the SDGs by 2030, we may probably fast track it and achieve it slightly earlier. So, बहुत मतलब आपके साथ मुझे लगता है कि हमारा जो दर्शक है जो आखिरी समाज की आखिरी छोर पे बैठा हुआ अगर हमारा दर्शक भी ये देखेगा तो मुझे लग उसे ये लगेगा कि निश्चित तौर पे United Nation और आप जैसे जो लोग जुड़े हुए हैं तो वो समाज को किस तरीके से आगे एक दिशा देनी है दशा देनी है उसके लिए आप लोग सचेत हैं आप लोग कार्य कर रहे हैं और सर आपको मतलब मैं बहुत धन्यवाद देना चाहूँगा और आपका बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया कि आपने हमें समय दिया अपना कीमती वक्त दिया और निश्चित तौर पर मुझे लगता है कि अगली दफ़े जब हम लोग मिलेंगे तो कीनिया और इंडिया के और लंबे रिलेशन के ऊपर बात करेंगे बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया सर धन्यवाद